three, two, one. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So we have a very special guest today with mm -hmm. the Humane Podcast. We have, uh, he's a data science specialist, and we're going to be here with him talking to you about AI. Um, just a very brief introduction, David Yakobovich. Welcome, David. Thanks, Terrence. Thanks, Juan. Appreciate having me. Cool. Yeah, man. Well, thanks for uh, coming here. So. Yeah. We wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, data science and AI stuff, man. So um, your background is data science. What exactly does the position of data science entail, I guess? So at its simplest, data science has become an industry where anything to do with data and the analysis is being solving problems. But where we're seeing data science today as the entire industry is the focus is around algorithms and optimizing problem solving. Data science can get a lot more granular. There's many titles we're seeing throughout the industry. And today I run a lot of executive workshops for data science at Galvanize, one of the leading boot camps in the States. Mm -hmm. And we talk about some of the big titles today, which include like data analyst, data scientist, uh, and data engineer. And the data scientist is the one that focuses on algorithms. Mm. Interesting. Okay. So you said data engineer as well. What's the difference between a data engineer and a data scientist? So what we've seen in the data side of organizations are the data analysts will do a lot of reporting, analytics, helping with business objectives. The data scientist will empower those objectives by using algorithms to get better results. And the data engineer will help deploy that into production. So that means if you're using a cloud system like AWS, GCP, or Azure, they'll get your data architecture set up, mm -hmm. make sure that the algorithm pipeline is running smooth, and that as loads scale up or down depending on network bandwidth um, everything's running smooth that's really what a data engineer helps with today gotcha interesting so you said some uh some acronyms there <laughs> that i'm not uh, familiar with <laughs> well azure is like microsoft's own data oh you're familiar with remember one. correctly yeah yeah okay okay um, and i guess that's um some common some common stuff that uh is within the uh, data science in science industry yes yeah, so it's so interesting as we've been going work from home, especially with COVID-19, traditionally a lot of engineering firms spent both on-premise, which means at their own warehouses and factories with data centers, and then on cloud platforms like Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, or Google mm -hmm. Cloud Platform. But we've seen just in the last few months, there has been over a thousand percent load increase on a lot of these platforms because everyone is becoming digital first companies as we're now this digital first society. Mm -hmm. um, it's incredible to see that services that you once would run inside an office can no longer be possible, mostly because of quarantine and containment procedures. So we're seeing uh, an emergence of the cloud platforms and that's why companies like Amazon, Google, and Microsoft have not slowed down any hiring during COVID-19. Interesting. Mm, mm. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. Uh, I imagine they would have, though. Yeah, I imagine it's actually become more of a load, as David said. So, you know, that's got to be tough to deal with. But I'm sure that uh, Amazon and Google and them have been well prepared to handle this. Is so, that true? So it's interesting. When we look at cloud services, typically you have regions. A region can be like Virginia or it could be San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And in each region, you'll have what are known as availability zones. Every availability zone is a data center. And those data centers can be, you know, huge factories or warehouses with cooling mm -hmm. and machines and kept very safe uh, to have data and to have systems that are being processed. Uh, when you run systems on the cloud, they're not in just one region or one availability zone, but they could be on multiple availability zones, basically multiple data centers in a location and multiple regions, depending on where your listeners or viewers are at. Mm -hmm. Now, companies like AWS, GCP, Azure, they've been at this for now going on over 15 years in the cloud. So systems like Amazon, for example, they're all over the world. 
which means they've definitely been preparing, but not preparing for such a quick scale up. So naturally, mm. there have been, as we've seen during COVID-19, some disruptions of different services. Mm -hmm. If any of you uh, or your listeners are fans of Zoom, Zoom grew from 10 million users to 200 million users overnight. So there mm -hmm. definitely was some growing pains in the cloud. Yeah. You any, uh, do you have any thoughts about why Zoom in particular, David? Because I know, you know, we're actually using Google Meets right now. Google pay us. Um, <laughs> we, we also are familiar with like Skype. Um, there's other services out there. Why Zoom? So uh, as an educator in the space, you know, working with boot camps, we do a lot of offerings in person and online. And we also experiment with a lot of different software. Now, um, at Galvanize, Zoom is our preferred platform, but that doesn't mean it's the platform that should scale. Um, I've worked with all of them, from Zoom to Teams to WebEx to mm. uh, any of these platforms that you're working with today. I'm always experimenting with new ones. What I found good about Zoom is a few things. First, Overall, the audio is good. Is it perfect? Not exactly. They're always improving mm. it. But in general, you don't hear as much echo or feedback from participants. Mm -hmm. um, in other software and platforms, sometimes we have more of that feedback. So I've had a good experience in Zoom. Um, overall, there's been many robust tools to annotate and draw on the screen, right. uh, to interact with your guests, whether in a private or non-private mode. And one of the biggest features, which predominantly is why education and workers have migrated to Zoom, is this feature called Breakout Rooms. And Breakout Rooms lets you dive into brainstorming sessions and then come back together as one group after. Now, because of that success, you know, Teams and Google and all these other platforms are quickly adding these features. But as we know in technology, first mover advantage holds the power. Right. Uh, and Zoom's been doing well. They've, of course, had their own growing pains with security and encryption, uh, mm -hmm. and that's led to some challenges in the market, but they've been very quick to resolve it. They separated data centers from China. They've required rating, waiting rooms to be required. They've set password protection. They just bought a new encryption startup for a couple hundred million dollars. So I think they're going all in to make sure they're leaving the market. Interesting. Very interesting. I have a question, kind of pivoting a little bit, but more about... Um, companies hiring and stuff um do you think there seems to be this trend now like twitter just announced that most employees can now just work from home indefinitely um is that something that we're you think we're probably going to be seeing more of in terms of just companies like you know if you're a data scientist and stuff or data engineer uh, you probably you probably report to an office, but now since you can work from home, do you think this is something companies are just going to completely shift to? So as we've been moving into a society that's mm. computer first with humans augmenting those systems, we've naturally been moving into an environment uh, where we don't have to be all co-located together. Mm. And that's where we've seen a lot of startups that have been successful with distributed systems and remote systems. These are startups like Buffer and where they have a distributed workforce all over the world. And many other companies are doing that as well. The challenge that COVID-19 presents for everyone is if you live in a big city like myself in Manhattan, where we have 100-story skyscrapers, yeah. and we have companies like JP Morgan and Facebook and Google that have towers that rise up many, many levels, the challenge is all these workers are co-located, but now we're in a very interesting situation where we can't go to the office even if we want to. And the challenge has been that a lot of companies over the last 15 years, although they've set up work from home policies where maybe you could work remote one day or two day a week, or depending on how essential your role is, we've been moving towards work from home and virtual machines, but never on this scale. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of companies were hesitant. They thought productivity would fall through the roof. We would do terrible. Um, employees would just not be successful with social isolation, with mental health challenges, but it could not be further from the truth. For companies that have tech workers and tech-enabled jobs based on computers, productivity is at par or above since the start of COVID. Now, of course, there's business models being disrupted and economies of scale that are shifting as a result yeah. of lockdowns and quarantines. But from a work from home perspective, we've been doing quite okay. 
There's a lot of challenges, again, like mental health, which need to be explored further. Um, and this isn't for essential workers. This is really for the new economy or the digital economy. The question, though, scales bigger than just during COVID because we are going to emerge through this. We are already seeing reopening in states like California, Arizona, and New York City in the last few weeks where mm -hmm. we started phase one of the four phases to get open with education and restaurants to follow you know, later in the summer. Um, but the big question a lot of my friends in tech are saying is, well, should I leave Manhattan, right? Can I just work from home forever? <laughs> yeah. Is this the new normal? Um, in addition to being a data scientist, I'm also an investor in angel startups. So I look at different industries like healthcare, education, direct to consumer, work from home verticals, uh, and any products that consumers can use to increase productivity. Mm -hmm. My thesis is that we are always moving to digital transformation, which means work from home enables that process, but that's not what society wants. We are humans, we desire human connection. So mm -hmm. I think what we're gonna be moving towards definitely in the short to near term, which means upwards of 18 months, a lot of work from home. Companies like Twitter, Google, and Facebook have already said work from home through the end of 2020. Um, Jack Dorsey from Twitter said you can work from home forever. So we have some of those yeah. policies being set. Um, I think once we get coronavirus or COVID-19 at bay, whatever that timeline is, whether from social distancing practices with PPE or actually a vaccine if and when that does occur. Um, I think two to three years out, uh, we are gonna be all in person. We're gonna be craving that in-person experience. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen how even music festivals in Denmark for 2021 have already sold out now in 2020. <laughs> so, so my belief is big cities like Manhattan, mm. uh, New York City, and San Francisco are going to actually get bigger as a result of COVID-19 because people want to be in aggregation economies where all the things are happening. But in right. the short term, you know, there might be some shakeout. Interesting. Mm. So, yeah, that's that's uh, very, very um insightful uh projection for the future yeah I, um well i, I wanted to kind of add, add or, or just kind of indulge a little bit on this data science train but y you seem to have worked on multiple data science projects i imagine i mean this is your expertise and this is your forte um so what what kind of I guess what kind of projects did you work on and or maybe you don't have to go into like every single one but maybe pick out a couple that that were very like I would just say almost passion projects for you uh just to kind of get an idea of more of the aspect of what you what you might what the public might think a data scientist is I guess yeah, so I think the public thinks in general of data science as looking at shows like Mr. Robot and Silicon Valley and all this exactly. magic and glam happening <laughs> with software engineering. Yeah. But most of the work today is collecting data, organizing it to be in a good state of being clean to then get answers to unanswered questions. Some of those unanswered questions, projects that I've worked on, has been how to make housing more affordable in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. um, how to ensure that employees are paid on time with payroll providers, um, how different people who have different insurance policies from vulnerable populations aren't receiving unnecessary premium hikes just because of their status, uh, how large organizations can scale a footprint while making sure that employees have increased productivity, um, and even how you can actually scale educational offerings uh, on cloud platforms while ensuring accessible and equitable outcomes. And all these problems I'm sharing, which are just some of the ones I've worked on throughout my career, are thinking first and foremost about the human, secondly, about the data that's being collected, mm. and then third, how do you optimize for the result or get this unanswered question answered if at all possible mm. so i guess that is the relevance of your podcast name so uh for the audience out there david has a podcast called is it pronounced humane david that's right uh, it's the humane podcast humane is from french which means to be human mm -hmm. yes so i guess that's very interesting so you you kind of focus on the human first and then you apply your models or, or whatever you would call it to that uh, system with a human perspective. Is that accurate to say? That, 
I think that's exactly accurate. You know, we've seen from leaders like Fei Fei Li from both Google and Stanford and other organizations that there's been this movement towards human first or human centered design or human centered AI. We're seeing a lot of organizations move in that direction. Uh, I think I was coming up with this idea, similar timeline of many of these organizations on the West Coast in California and mm -hmm. in Europe. And what I wanted to do is add a voice to these topics. You know, it's very tough to get some of these leading researchers to engage with them and to have a conversation that's an intimate fireside chat, but for a broader audience. Mm -hmm. So I interview on Humane people who I'd love to speak to and learn more about and who I look up into mm -hmm. the industry. But we dive deep into these topics, all centered with the human elements. And sometimes it's more technical on the AI data science. And sometimes it's more futuristic. We got uh, Nicholas Badminton, one of the futurists coming on in the next few weeks in Humane. And we even get some developer education tools like from startups like Weights and Bias and uh, even other interesting startups that we're talking to who are just changing the game for coding. Interesting. Hmm. So let's go a little bit down that rabbit hole, David. So AI specifically. So when we think of AI, you know, we all have the images of like Terminator and, you know, Cyberdyne systems and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Marvel's, uh, what is that? That event or age of Ultron age of Ultron, yeah, you know, yeah. it's the, the, the human element is always stripped away from that. Could you kind of give us, um, more, I guess, more of a concrete example of how the human perspective could come into a, an AI project like that. So what we're seeing today with a lot of startups, um, not just in the United States and, and also big companies that like these cloud platforms we talked about before, is companies are looking at how do we help humans be the most productive on the more cognitively challenging tasks which means where AI is being used to solve problems today is around routine and repetitive tasks. Um, there's a great venture in New York City. They just raised a massive uh, round of funding called ASAP, A-S-A-P-P. ASAP uh, powers chatbots uh, for the telecommunication industry. They help workers at companies like Sprint, Verizon, T-Mobile, AT&T to better do their jobs. And what that means is should the focus of your work be hello customer if you're on you know the the website you know sending these standard uh, uh canned messages or should it be helping you know what's the sentiment of who you're talking to uh, what are different ways that you can get towards a resolution quicker um, what are different techniques based on the history of the individual that can be used to help identify if it's a recurring problem or a new problem so that's just one startup. Um, they just raised a $185 million round and they're all around using NLP, this natural language processing, these text and audio systems to improve customer engagement. Um, and what that does is their representatives at these call centers or these telecom companies can better focus on achieving equitable outcomes for their customers. That's one use case where we're seeing AI at work. Interesting. Mm. So I'm, I'm kind of on the more technical side, I guess, since Terrence and I are, we were scientists. And so I'm kind of intrigued by the kind of models that y'all do or like the fitting that y'all do. Cause I, I know physicists are employed as data scientists. I've known a couple mm. people from our university go on and work for data science companies. And yeah, you uh, kind of think like, is it just, are we looking at graphs all day? And yeah, what are we doing? <laughs> trying, are we to fitting, trying to rate something? Are we fitting models? Like, you know, <laughs> what, what are we doing? What, what yeah. is going on? At, like, what is going on there, I guess? I mean, we've definitely seen, uh, I'll agree with you that um, very technical people who even don't come from a coding background um, mm -hmm. can be very successful as data scientists, um, especially if you're a physicist who's working today in C++, MATLAB, um, Stata, or any of these other software packages. It's actually a quite smooth transition into other frameworks like Python and R and whether that's, you know, doing a master's program at a location like Florida State University or Hell going yeah. to a boot camp like Galvanize <laughs> or, uh, or Insight Data Science, mm -hmm. um, it's always possible. And the thing is, uh, when you look at data science, it's become this whole industry that now you see like it's the sexiest job of the century, right? That's what right. some people say. Um, but there's not too much glamorous about it. It's people who like to do research and solve 
problems. And those problems can be big. I mean, they could be billion dollar problems. They could be industry defining problems, but there's a lot of work that goes into it. Um, the data scientists that enjoy the work the most is in a role that can be very focused on those algorithms. So what that could mean is you have this data and as you just said, Juan, you're trying to fit a model to that data, but it's not as easy as let's take a model and throw it at the data and see what happens. There's so many things that need to occur to get there. And one of the biggest areas that I think is very underserved today in data science is an area called data refinement. Um, I have this framework for the five steps of design thinking in data science, which I define as data collection, data refinement, data enrichment, data learning, and data maintenance. Five steps to getting to a good data workflow. Mm -hmm. And companies today do a very good job with collecting data. We have it, we've had it for many years. Mm -hmm. um, we're very good at generating models, doing all the learning with the algorithms, because that's the machine. Mm -hmm. um, but where we're failing is the refinement and enrichment stages. We're not getting the data to a good enough state. Now, when you say refinement and enrichment, uh, David, does that mean like how you interpret the data? So refinement is definitely about interpretation. That could mean that you have empty values in a certain column. That could mean mm. how do you take something like three blue, one brown, or some numbers or different <laughs> letters and change them to be understood by a machine. So there's a lot of context changing that's needed. And traditionally, when we look at an NLP or natural language processing example, like I was describing with ASAP, that startup with chatbots, all the work they do is they take these words and they tokenize them into numbers because a machine can't understand words. Everything must be quantifiable as a number basis. Um, so we have to be able to interpret everything as numbers. And then no matter what model or algorithm is chosen, everything in data science today is about pattern recognition or pattern matching. And there's now so many research papers and so many algorithms that attempt to find the best pattern depending on the use case. But that's what it comes down to. How can we extract patterns that are meaningful from the data? And the refinement area is so key because a lot of times researchers and data scientists will go on a race to hit a deadline or hit a milestone. We need to get this into production in three weeks, says the boss. Well, that's excellent. Well, what are the goals we're looking to achieve is a question that a data scientists should be asking. And there's at least 60 of these questions that I think data scientists should be asking to their teams that I have in that design thinking framework, which include like who owns the data? Um, how much more data do we need to get a good result? What benchmarks are even important? You know, am I looking at a certain metric as we go into the weeds in this conversation? You know, is the metric accuracy or is it something like precision or recall which is words that data scientists love. And finally today, of all the time in history, everyone in the world's hearing about precision and recall because of COVID-19 and all the tests that are not that accurate. And then all the researchers are going deeper into, well, what other metrics can tell us whether a saliva a test or an antibody test shows good results? So I know I just Open up Pandora's box and a few topics, but no, this is this is excellent. This is excellent because uh, yeah, because I mean, like this whole COVID thing, right? We we they have data scientists fitting models and stuff, and trying to project, you know, what's going to happen as new data comes in and re incorporating um, just more information about this. Because I mean, obviously, businesses want to try to survive this, first of all, <laughs> uh, economically. And so I imagine there's a lot of data, I'm, I'm sure you have a lot of data, sci data scientist friends working on this particular thing. Um, and is there anything that, I guess, do you have anything to say about that? Like how data science looks like in terms of like working or solving the problem of COVID? Because you said it was like a, it is a huma hum humanity issue. Uh, <laughs> so I, I kind of want to open up the floor for you for that. Yeah, I mean, uh, so Juan, COVID, of course, is on everybody's mind, yeah. rightfully so. We've <laughs> all been in lockdown for going on 10 weeks, depending mm -hmm. where we are in the world. And as we're reopening, one of the biggest challenges that's emerged in the data science community is who is best to interpret 
data around COVID. Is it the data scientists or is it the epidemiologists, these medical professionals mm -hmm. who are all day, every day looking at cancer cells and different patterns in healthcare data? Mm -hmm. And it actually could be the epidemiologists or the epidemiologists partnering with the data scientists. What we look at today in the data science industry is you need to have two things to be successful. One, technical domain experience, and second, business domain experience. And the challenge when it comes to solving COVID-19 is data scientists are not usually in the healthcare industry, so they're missing that business domain. I think the partnership there can get us on a fast track to seeing um, improvements in tracking and tracing, um, in testing and getting better treatments to those who um, are diagnosed in hospitals, whether they're vulnerable populations with diabetes or over the age of 65. Um, we've seen a lot of hackathons come out in the last few months that have been trying to solve problems evolving with COVID, especially around tracking and tracing. I recently had a, another post in Towards Data Science about what are the top 10 hackathons out uh, in this space in case uh, people are interested to learn about that data so we can plug it with the audience so they can check it out. Mm -hmm. um, but I think data scientists uh, don't have it all figured out, you know, and, and part of it's because there's not enough data, you know. Now, that would be remiss of me to say that it's all about the data. Like, <laughs> you know, if, if you have the data, suddenly it's magic, right? Um, but it's not. Um, we've even seen how in Iceland, they've had about 40% of the population who've installed these track and trace apps, similar to the ones that Google and Apple are making in the United States. And although they have all this data collection right now, the cases of COVID are not going down. They haven't discovered anything useful or interesting yet. Mm. I think we will get there, um, but I think it's still the early stages. In gotcha. Gotcha. Interesting. So I'm going to shift it a little bit, David. Um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to touch upon here related to artificial intelligence. And actually, I don't even know if it's considered artificial intelligence. Um, there are two, two types of... Um, uh, uh, computer science concepts that are a little bit new and powerful that that's a that are big buzzwords right now, and the, one of them being machine learning, uh, and then the other one being neural networks. And I guess they're even combined in some sense. I guess what I want to ask you is like, what's the difference between machine learning, neural networks? How does it fit in the um, overall architecture of artificial intelligence? Sure. So these are definitely buzzwords that are thrown around. What we can look at as machine learning is the big field of applying algorithms to data and trying to automate that process through machines. So that's machine learning. Inside the field of machine learning, you can have AI. So AI is where the machine learning happens, but it's iterating over time by itself with new data and making insights without a human. So that's the AI part. Deep learning is a subset of AI where that learning happens, but deep learning is with neural networks. It's a specific type of technique where you have traditional algorithms like linear regression or decision trees, but they're run into multiple layers to recognize patterns. And once at least two of those layers are put together, that is built as a network. And that network is called deep learning. Very nice. Very succinct too. I think I'm finally understanding the borders between these things. <laughs> because usually when you will talk to data scientists or people who work with, you know, large amounts of data like that, they kind of cross over into, you know, deep learning and machine learning and all over the place. So the boundaries get a little bit muddled. Um, so very interesting. So I guess um, the big, the big, the big uh, one that everybody is always trying to strive for, though, is the AGI, you know, the artificial general, general intelligence. Um, could you maybe talk about that and maybe even see how an AGI might be useful for your mission? Yeah, so artificial general intelligence is getting to a point where we're passing a Turing test, where a machine is so good that you don't even know it's a machine. It's a human, right? And we can look at shows today like uh, Upload and Westworld and many and devs and all these different shows that are playing around with AGI. Um, we're not there yet. We have some systems that are getting good at a band of AI known as narrow AI. 
narrow AI is where you basically have AGI, but it's for a specific use case. So we have really good narrow AI at beating world-class Dota 2 players. Really good narrow AI at beating people at chess and Go. Really good narrow AI at converting audio to text and then making a recommendation back and forth. Where we're starting to uncover the truth of the possibilities of AI has been particularly around text analysis, and it's a new industry called transfer learning. Uh, this transfer learning industry, there's been a lot of work at it for a couple of decades, but just in the last year or two, we're seeing breakthroughs. Uh, transfer learning basically says is I can have a data set of data, let's call it about farming patterns and bees and um, wild, you know, African hornets and, and all these interesting creatures around farming and understanding patterns. And I can understand the context of questions and answering dialogue systems fed based on that data. But what if I insert brand new data that's completely foreign here? Uh, mm. African locusts, uh, sorghum crop, uh, the patterns of the Sahara winds, can we get an effective question and answering system? That's the breakthroughs we're starting to see in 2020. Hmm. Hmm. So that's, that's interesting. It leads me to a new question of where, um, David, do you think are going to be some of the bigger realms of development within the AI sector? Or ones that maybe even you're excited about seeing growing, I guess, in a more, um, in a more uh, uh, closer timeline right now? So there's so many trends in the AI space, and it's been said that it's as transformative for the world as electricity was for the world just over 100 years ago. Um, the big areas that we're seeing transformation today that will continue to accelerate for the next five to 10 years are both around text and audio, or NLP, and images or video, computer vision. So those are the near short term where Soon, all apps are going to integrate these in some capacity, whether they're being built in-house or they're being set up as unique systems on cloud services. Uh, everything's going to be having these use cases, and they're going to continue to get more precise, more accurate, and so seamless that you won't even know it's an AI. And mm -hmm. we already have that today. You know, you have your Apple iPhones or your Samsung Galaxy phones, and when you take an image, you have HDR. Right, this high mm -hmm. definition relay, and this is basically an AI merging images together, finding the best and sharpest just juxtapositions. Interesting. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, there's this. Um, so you seem to have this kind of like human. Uh, do Do you find that a lot of, I guess, data scientists have your perspective or philosophy of AI? Because it seems to me that the general public is. How would you say uh, <laughs> skeptical? Yeah, of AI. yeah. a little bit touchy about the subject. Um, yeah, they, you know, they, even I don't know um, if you're the e in the Elon Musk camp, uh, David, but uh, <laughs> we know he's very um, alarmist about the future of AI. You know, are we going to all die from the hand of the robots? So, <laughs> it do do a lot of. Do, would you say that your your um, methodology or ideology is common within the sector? Well, I'm not saying that my methodology is contrarian, but I think these are conversations that people have only been exploring in the last few years. So we are seeing more data scientists coming up about saying, let's be human humanitarian first. Um, and I think it's important that we're not just having dialogue, but we're having action. Because if you're a consumer, there's a lot to worry about, especially in the United States. Some of that means is your personally identifiable information being used by systems without your permission. We saw a company called Clearview AI that was scraping Google images and taking everyone's images and building databases and then selling this data to police departments throughout the entire United States, including the government, to know if you are who you say you are to basically track and trace, but without anyone's knowledge. Basically, it would be a clear violation of GDPR. So there's a lot to be concerned about. There's been hiring systems in the last couple of years that were intentionally, you know, taking women out of the hiring process. Mm -hmm. um, but when we have data scientists to help, you know, check these processes to make sure that they are being fair, equitable, uh, traceable, I think that helps in the process. Um, you know, when we look at Elon Musk, I think what he's doing for science is an advent that many people 
um, are not giving enough respect and diligence to. Um, sure, he stepped down from the board of OpenAI, but that's letting Sam Altman and others lead in that space. Um, I think Elon's up to bigger things that many people don't appreciate, you know, transforming energy across the world, transforming exploration across the universe. I mean, at <laughs> at its finest, that's what Elon's really up to. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he has some contrarian opinions. Um, so I think data scientists will start moving more in this direction. Uh, I've had conversations pre-COVID and even during about who is responsible about having these conversations. Right. Today, when we look at technical teams, you got product managers, software engineers, data scientists, but most people don't own up to taking on the responsibility. Um, I think it's gonna be hybrid. I think generally it should fall under the camp of a data scientist who takes the leadership point of view on ensuring humans are kept in the loop. But I think everyone does owe it to be part of that process. Interesting. Mm. You said so. You said an acronym that you threw in there. GD, what did you say? GDPR, is that what you said? Oh, sure. Yeah, that's right. GDPR. It's the Global Data Protection Regulation uh, that uh, was launched in the late 2010s in Europe and just passed um, in late 2018 uh, to become a law. What it basically means is um, if you're a consumer and someone has your data, you as the consumer have the right to be forgotten. If I reach out to you and let's call you uh, Google.com and I say, I don't want you indexing my name because it's my personal information, Google's required to respond. And if they don't respond within a certain period of time, they can be fined. And those fines are not small. In fact, for each violation, it can be up to $15 million. Wow. Um, and just in the past year, Google and Facebook have been fined billions of dollars in GDPR violations. Um, it's only for the Europe, the Shenzhen area, but we're seeing similar policies moving in the same direction in the United States. Uh, in late 2019, California passed uh, a bill called the California Consumer Protection Act, mm -hmm. which is basically GDPR, but for California. Prior to COVID, New York had the New York Privacy Act on the docket for legislation, but that's been you know postponed um, for quite a while for good reasons. So you work in this circle of, I mean, you've been employed, I imagine, by big data mining companies. So this is probably a touchy subject for you, maybe, <laughs> like the, a, a sort of digital bill of rights. Uh, I, I know that that term has been thrown around a couple times. I personally, I don't think, I, I don't think it's going, going to be possible to pass, although I would like it. It sounds, it sounds like something... Um, sort of obvious uh, that we should have a, a right to our own privacy in a sense. But um, but I kind of want to hear your take on it. Um, I'm sure I'm sure a lot of people in tech would like to uh, have a right to their own privacy, but um, or data uh, or sort of sort of managing their data. Google's a little bit more face forward about this, I think. But um, but I kind of want to hear what what you know, other tech people um, that you've met have to say, or even what your take on it is? The, the challenge with data is the following. Mm -hmm. If you don't have data, you can't answer questions yeah. that are unanswered. <laughs> so this is where privacy, this is where digital bill of rights is at the heart of the issue. And it's all over the world. It's a different conversation that's taking place. When we're talking in the United States, we're traditionally coming from a government policy that is pro-liberty and pro-consumer rights first and foremost. Mm -hmm. When we go to countries like Singapore and China and other East Asian nations, it's a different policy that they've been living with for many generations. We believe the state protects us and we give our right so that the state can lead us to our next uh, great movement. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very interesting that the conversations often had in the United States are in a little echo chamber bubble about our digital bill of rights. Um, I think our movement is similar to Europe, except that Europe is very much um, about willing to debate and see all sides of the issue versus in the United States, we get um, quite antagonized about when people don't agree with our philosophies or opinions. Now, I think as data scientists and physicists, we're often willing to debate and see what is the ground truth. Um, right. And I think yeah, please chime in. No, I said, right, right. No, exactly. Keep, keep <laughs> I was just saying, yes, we're more willing to debate. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, keep going, keep going. 
Yeah, and I mean, I think my my take ultimately on it is it definitely depends where you are in society, since every country has a different outlook there. Um, and if there's a movement that you're passionate about, that you want to be a leader for, consider where in the world you want to do that. Um, because I have mad respect for what China and Singapore has achieved with their social monitoring programs that have ensured they've reduced crime, they've increased attention and engagement in classrooms, mm. and they built a better system for collecting payments. Um, but things like that may not go over well in the United States. <laughs> hmm, interesting. So that actually kind of made me think of one thing. So me and one have a bunch of social media, and one of them being uh, TikTok. So TikTok was this social media that kind of had some a little bit of controversy because it was owned by China, a Chinese company first, and then they incorporated a large swath of you know American audience, and um, people were a little bit hesitant to join it in America because, you know, we kind of think of China, as you were saying, as the, as they allow a lot of their personal freedoms or, you know, allow the government to take a lot of those personal freedoms. Could you tell us, um, you know, a little bit about, I don't know if you know anything about TikTok, but like maybe some apps where they might be owned by an outside or a foreign government and then how that might influence, you know, U.S. citizens. Yeah, so I'll, I'll dive into um, three really interesting and different apps. Uh, first and foremost, let's look at Zoom because that's the big one that's been in the news the last few months. <laughs> right, right. Um, Zoom got a lot of backlash, right? Yeah. Uh, and that backlash was because all their data, or m much of it, was being reproduced on servers in China. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was a big issue because a lot of Americans were like, we're not going to stand for this. And Zoom was not up front that people's <laughs> data was being stored in China. It's not until developers said, hmm, well, I want to retrieve my data. Wait, why is it coming from servers in China? So, so that was an issue there. Um, but I think then Zoom saw the writing on the wall and they wanted to grow with COVID without you know, being disrupted um, or having antitrust or whatever mm. that would look like with administration. So they set that by default off and you have to opt in for China. Um, the challenge has been is the United States as the number one economy in the world is vying against China, the number two economy in the world. And can we do that as collaboration or is that going to be more social distancing? COVID has shown us that researchers are always willing to work together. And we've seen so many more publications happening during COVID than any other illness ever mm. throughout society. Mm -hmm. um, even dating back to HIV and AIDS. Uh, what we're seeing beyond startups like Zoom, I mean, mm -hmm. we look at TikTok, for example, which is, many people say, it's the new Snap, it's the new Insta, right? Mm -hmm. And TikTok is still owned by the Chinese. Don't let anyone tell you anything other than that. They're owned by a parent company called ByteDance. But what TikTok has done is they've been told that if they want to operate under U.S. policy, they have to distance themselves from the Chinese government, especially if they want access to capital and if they want to eventually IPO on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh. So to do that, they've set up a separate entity. Mm -hmm. um, they're in the US, they're still operated by the parent entity, um, but now they're hiring thousands of people in the US and aiming to be the next big social network. Uh, will they achieve it? I think it's still early to tell right. because I think um, Insta owned by Facebook and Snap are replicating and creating things as quick as TikTok does. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if Kevin Hart is enough to keep TikTok alive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's growing though. <laughs> um, very cool. Very interesting. Yeah. I've always wanted to know what what um, what the Chinese, you know, were doing with the data, you know, specifically. Um, You'll never know. Because <laughs> I want to know. I mean, why I'll tell you what they're doing with it. I mean, <laughs> well, they have it's... teams of data scientists who are mining the data and doing analysis on it. You but know, they I, have I... just like we have research parks in San Francisco, right. in Seattle, and New York. They have research parks, but you know, China's about 1.5 plus billion people. Mm. So they have a few more data scientists yeah. working on the data than we do in the States. Why would they want to know what, this, what the Americans want? We're so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm making fun of Americans, but you know, it's like all we want is cheeseburgers, sports, and <laughs> uh, TV. I don't know. Just, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think the challenge is 
can we predict human behavior? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what mm -hmm. all data is about. Right. You know, if right. we can predict if a human's going to get angry, if they're going to get happy, if they're going to make a purchase, then that's data at work. And the more data you have on different demographics and different profiles or personas, you're going to do better there. So for a company yeah. like TikTok, sure, we got a billion and a half Chinese using the platform. But wow, what if we got 350 million Americans using the platform yeah. and they come from a traditional capitalistic society while China is from a alternative capitalistic society? Mm -hmm. How does behavior differ? Mm, interesting. Mm. Yeah, this, uh, I mean, th this is a boon for most economists, you know, um, in terms of like, not, not like you're saying behavioral economics, but also just being able to completely predict the consumer. Yeah, this is mm. something that boggles my mind because sometimes I swear, I, I, I swear, this may be marketing, but uh, sometimes I'll think of something and then I'll see it on my phone. But <laughs> I don't know if I saw the thing and then I see it on my and then I think about it and then I see it on my phone and I'm like, I was just thinking about that. But it, it could very well be that I saw it. I, I wasn't aware of it or conscious of it and then i saw it again so, so it, there, it there's feels two predictive things in a way. going on there yeah, yeah. there's two things going on there Juan. the first one is there's a recall effect right mm -hmm. so you know it could be that you're interested in something you didn't notice it before and then you see it which yes. is interesting but that's probably not all that's happening um if you've ever searched for a term yes in google that is being indexed yes and there's machine learning running up against that to offer you ads that are personalized. Mm -hmm. So even if you're just searching about buying a new car, but you don't put a model, but then Google has all your demographics and they say, you know what, we're gonna serve up to Juan, you know, this new BMW, because you know, we've pulled up that his parents own the BMW, not mm -hmm. saying this is true, right? <laughs> and and all I this wish. other information. <laughs> so we're gonna serve it up to him. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. Um, also, uh, traditionally, a lot of these social platforms, wherever you upload your data, whether it's text, audio, or video, mm -hmm. whether it's a social platform, whether it's a storage platform, what I tell listeners here of the show is if you are not paying for a service somewhere in the terms and conditions that you checkmarked on starting that service, gave that organization the right to look into your data and to serve up with ad partners by reselling the data. Mm -hmm. now, they don't actually take your document and say that Juan wrote this for his physics report and you know, <laughs> Terrence did this for English class, yeah. but they'll use that to then make recommendations for you. So mm -hmm. they don't actually keep your data, they don't persist it, but they keep the recommendations, which mm -hmm. can be very scary or very offering of hope to get you things that you want faster yeah. than you do. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm very much consumer. I, I'm pro-consumer in the sense that, you know, I, I, I have Google Home in my home, in my house. Uh, I know they listen to me. Big mistake. Uh, I, know they, I, know they're, <laughs> I know they have a profile of me. I know that. And, but, but here's the thing. I sometimes throw, like, uh, throw them a curveball. I'll, <laughs> I'll just say something random that I don't like. And then just to kind of throw them off. So just to kind of piss you some data scientists off listening. Uh, no, I'm sure. They know everything. Yeah, I'm sure they, I'm sure they, they have statistical modeling and they're like, yeah, yeah. No, this is, that was an anomaly, the thing that he said. Okay, um, Google. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, no. <laughs> no, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, um, I'm generally pro-consumer and, uh, and yeah, I, I very much like this. Uh, I like how would you say, I think that's a sort of human aspect of the market in a way where you, you, you get things that you want. And I do like that predictiveness, but it is a little scary in the sense that when you see things, you're like, wow, they actually, they got me. Mm. They got me. Cause, <laughs> uh, I, like the other day I saw some shoes. I saw, I, I was looking to buy new shoes and I saw an ad for, shoes and i was like wow i actually like that i like the i like the brand <laughs> and they already knew and they knew the type mm -hmm. of shoe that i like and so i was like of course i'm gonna buy this shoe <laughs> so anyway yeah, I, it's I, very I, powerful so I, it's very powerful it's uh i i i enjoy it but i know there are a lot of people out there that that like terrence yeah, i don't enjoy who it freak all. out and they're like <laughs> how are they doing this? yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> See, it's all your search history. See, you may have yeah. liked a pair of Allbirds on mm -hmm. TikTok, Insta, Snap, mm -hmm. but even if you didn't like it, if you spent 10 seconds looking at it, right. the time you spent looking at it is also stored in the database, right. and mm. then that data is extracted as basically a like, right? Mm -hmm. So that information's used, um, and it's empowering, but it's also very um, concerning. Mm-hmm. So why does it scare you, Terrence? Well, I, I don't like, ask. well, because, you know, if you have some system where your every single move was predicted, it's almost like now you have no freedom. You know, actually, some part of the Internet I liked was, you know, you have a discoverability. You know, when everything is just shoved towards you that you have no say in what you're doing, it's just like, okay, yeah, I guess I like it. But like, where's the fun in me finding newer, interesting things that I wouldn't find before? So that's one element I think is lacking within the, you know, the data, the data science regime. You know, well, I guess maybe that's a good question, David. Do you think that maybe in the future the data science will become so good at predicting you that it will even be able to know things that are, you know, that you might be thinking outside of where you're, you're in it, you know, where you usually go? <laughs> You know, I, I think two of the most popular shows people have been watching during COVID have been Westworld with mm -hmm. Dolores in new season three. Right. No spoilers, I promise, for those <laughs> who haven't seen it yet. Um, and Devs, right? The FX Hulu show with Lily. Mm -hmm. um, and what's so fascinating is these two shows are captivating our imagination because both of them in these seasons are talking about data gets so good that is their free will. And that's what mm. both seasons explore. You know, in devs, you got these engineers of a company called Amaya, which is very similar, shall we say, to Google or Alphabet, where they have data on everybody and mm -hmm. can they predict or not predict certain things. And then in the new season of Westworld. Spoiler alert, skip 30 seconds ahead. If you don't want to hear any Westworld spoilers, you're welcome. You know, we have this main uh, robotic, you know, AGI character that basically uncovers and discovers something about all people that we always knew was there, but we never knew by public, mm -hmm. which is that data was being collected by Delos. So mm -hmm. that's the little spoiler I'll give, but the data <laughs> by Delos, which for those who watched season two, we saw how Hale, you know, shipped it up to a satellite ray into space. We don't yeah. know where it went, but um, that data exists. And it's interesting on our minds. I mean, I think we're already getting there as a society. I mean, in a sense that private doesn't exist. Um, there's even the new Amazon show that recently came out called Upload, where basically, you know, when you live your life, they talk about this even in episode one, right? When you pass, no longer do you have to go to wherever you go, right? Let's call that heaven or, or wherever. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? You can go to a new heaven, and that heaven is up in the digital sphere. Mm. Um, and you know, it's so interesting because that's something that we can predict. And that's something that I guarantee companies are building today. Yeah, mm. it seems, uh, I think Terrence's concern is that um, your the modeling would get so good that your life feels deterministic, right? You're able to predict someone's behavior uh, maybe an hour in, it, in their mm. own in advance. So you know what they're going to go eat. Or, or in a sense, they might even influence you or nudge you in that direction, right? Mm, that's another I mean, scary that's, one. I mean, that's ad, yeah. I mean, but those, Terrence, those are ads. Like, that's like that's what but marketing is, is. Maybe, maybe I'm like the uh, crazy guy with the tinfoil <laughs> hat, but I just foresee, you know, technology is exponential, right? And you know, we keep going and going with this route. It gets scary to me the level of predictive power that a machine can have, just because we know a machine is already so much better than humans at these certain finite things, Scaling. like you mentioned before, go chess, and then it's going to be so much powerful and so much smarter than us. It, it leaves me a little bit worried that, you know, we're just sitting ducks at that point. You know, I don't ever want to, I don't, I don't know if I want to be around when there's something that exists that's smarter than humans. I do. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the, Big, oh, you do? Okay. I'm kidding. Well, I, I want to be there too. Juan's in the David camp and uh -huh. uh, Terrence is in the Elon Musk camp. Yes, maybe, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> 
you know, I mean, Andrew Yang, who was one of the presidential candidates mm-hmm. for 2020, uh, was talking about universal basic income or conditional basic income. You know, will we get to a point when so many things can be automated that there won't even be income to go around, where humans won't have jobs? Like, will mm-hmm. we get there? Um, you know, fortunate or unfortunate, COVID has been the biggest unprecedented experiment in modern human history, mm-hmm. where now this UBI, this universal basic income conversation comes back up. What will humans do if there aren't jobs? Um, look, as we continue to get more automation, as 5G rolls out, as new internet on things, devices connect, new jobs will be created. Um, in April 2019, Deloitte came out with a new report on super jobs, the future of work, and they said, we're moving into jobs 3.0. Jobs Mm -hmm. 3.0 is where the jobs in 10 years don't even exist yet. We're creating new jobs like drone repair people, right? We're creating people like machine learning ethicists. We're creating titles that we can't even fathom yet today. I mean, there's going to be a day where people are operating drones for food delivery. And that's already here, right? We're seeing that in Mm -hmm. Blacksburg, Virginia, where Amazon's delivering food, or Gainesville, Florida, where we have these little neuro robots giving uh, student lunches on the campus, Mm -hmm. which I'm sure FSU's working on at the same time. You know, we have so much changing that's gonna impact our experience. The question is, how much of that will improve our lives? And I think most of it will. I think one of the biggest challenges that keeps me up at night is how do we constantly reskill and upskill people right. to stay relevant for these new jobs? Because That's, as physicists and data yeah. scientists, we love to learn tech, but does that mean there's 350 million people that want to learn tech? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly the issue that I can kind of, and this is where UBI might come in because, you know, we're physicists and, and other scientists, uh, you know, we're, we, we almost have this sense of adapting and learning new things and learning new skills and techniques. And most people might not even be interested in doing any of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, they might want to lock in on one thing and learn it really well and, and just kind of, you know, get good at it. But, uh, but the, the tech is, and the economy is growing so fast or, or in, how would you say, yeah, you get tech growing so fast and, and it doesn't give enough time for people to be skilled up. and catch up yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And so and by the time, let's say you graduate uh, in a particular skill set, mm-hmm. that job might be going out the window mm-hmm, <laughs> because mm-hmm. something better has come to replace it. it. It's a little bit it's a little bit scary to think about. Um, right. And you kind of already I feel like. Well, I'm not even sure. Maybe, David, you can comment, comment on this. I am fearful of that, like, within the short term. You know, within the next, you know, five, ten years, you know, we're seeing projections of, you know, all this machine learning stuff, like, like we were talking about. Then also, like, you know, self-driving vehicles and things. And, you know, we're already seeing the McDonald's all has those little um, kiosks and things now. So it's like the technology just goes and goes and goes. And all these low-skill I mean, in another example is the grocery stores all have uh, self-checkouts. So these things keep going and going and all these low-skill jobs, quote-unquote, you know, what's going to be left for people to do? You know, it's so fascinating because we look at COVID-19 and one thing that we've realized is that essential workers truly are essential. Yes. You can set up a self-automated checkout, but it can't clean itself. It can't put coupons in. There's all these systems that are really struggling because they're programmed and made by humans, which means they can still be operated and designed by humans. I think what's going to happen is as we have more data at different endpoints, machines are going to be everywhere. In the foreseeable future, your apartment or home will have hundreds of talking devices. They're connected devices, everything from that OK Google to your lights, to your curtains, to your refrigerator. And soon there will be dozens more online. And the challenge is everything cannot be automated. There's going to be engineers and people helping to keep things online, programming, repairing these physical devices. Mm -hmm. I think you're right that, you know, we're 
focusing on four-year programs and post-grad programs, but the conversation needs to shift to apprenticeships. It needs to shift to vocational skills. And whether those are boot camps or continual learning, um, I think that's a pathway that a lot of people are going to start considering, especially post-COVID. Mm -hmm. We saw in the CARES Act that passed in March that mm -hmm. um, about 300 million of the 300 billion has been set aside for post-training, for helping furloughed employees, for getting people on track into vocational learning. Right. The HEROES Act, which is in passing as, as we're speaking or already passing, depending on where we are in society or its new form, um, is setting aside at least $90 billion into education transformation. We know the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's working on it as well. And many of the smartest and brightest in the Valley are saying everyone needs to learn tech, but it's going to be a different way of learning. Mm -hmm. I see the future of learning as not just being in the physical classroom. It could be online. It could be putting on a headset that's an Oculus Rift and learning as you're seeing driving, racing, being part of Formula One, even if you're mm -hmm. not on that track in the United Kingdom right. or Barcelona. Right. I think we're moving in that direction, um, but we have to be able to motivate, inspire everyone to have careers that are possible so that yeah. they have meaning and purpose in life. And that's the human part. I think of technology. Yeah. So David, I, I, I see you as a guy, since you call it, since, I mean, self-proclaimed angel, angel investor, I, I would presume that you're at the front lines of these seeing new jobs in a sense, or seeing how new jobs could come of certain, uh, maybe projects that you're, you're sort of uh, interested in. Yeah, um, here we go. Drop the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm oh, not that's looking, not where you're going. I'm, not for, I, I'm more looking. I'm more looking at at because because the economy right now, if I remember correctly, <clears throat> if I yeah, if I can recall, um, the the current U.S. economy is mostly financial, um, uh, and some of it is industry based, um, but on lower percentage, meaning that uh, by for folks that don't know, what I mean by financial economy is that our money makes money, and uh, and you know Wall Street and stuff like that. Mm. And so, um, they're, they're, we, we're not uh, a factory. Uh, we we don't manufacture a lot of goods anymore. We're already past that. What's the next? What's the next step above of financial economy? Ooh. Is it like you know you're saying we're moving into a new era of jobs or new age of jobs? What, what is I mean, I, I know that you question. don't. I know you don't have all the answers, but I'm saying, like, <laughs> <laughs> what's your take on that? Is there is there a what does society look like um, with AI? With I guess is there a post financial economy? Is there something above that? You mm. think? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the financial economy that we're at today is a result of all the evolution in the 1980s and 90s of mm -hmm. knowledge workers, of information workers, which has spawned IT and finance and, and technology and, mm -hmm. and all that discretionary money gets spent into the service economy, which is for us to spend our money in these fun and creative, entertaining, inspiring things, right? To reward ourselves and to feel free for like what's possible in life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what the world's been doing, right? And, and although we've moved away from manufacturing, COVID may bring some of that back to the US and Mexico and other areas around the states. Mm -hmm. But as the world keeps going, if we're gonna be one planet, you know, unless we very soon get to Mars, let's call that in a few years, um, <laughs> we're gonna run low in resources and AI is gonna help uh, minimize that. But I think our next economy is the creative economy. So as we get to a place beyond finance, and I don't have the period of time for that, right? So that could be in 40 years or 400 years, right? Mm -hmm. We don't know where that's going to be. Right. But if we're in that creative economy, everyone can pick up the skill that they want and take it to its fullest evolution. So we see today people like Ninja, who's an all-star Fortnite player, yeah. gets to play to his heart's content and be successful there. And sure, some of that's driven by money, but we look, he's been a player at the Halo franchise since the early 2000s never with a dime to his name and he's worked his way up. 
So I think we're going to be able to explore what we want to do to just see human potential. But it is very out there, right? It's very yeah. like Joe Rogan, Elon <laughs> Musk, and where we'll be there. Yeah. Um, I think we're not there yet. And we're not going to be there for a while as long as people make money, they spend money, and it has to do with resources. Mm-hmm. One of the biggest misconceptions that people see about countries in the East, like China, is that China is just a communism. But it's no longer like that. They are still, don't get us wrong, a country that's defined around the state first, that state-owned, state-operated, mm-hmm. and state-based enterprises, but they are very much capitalistic in nature. Mm-hmm. The whole world today is driven by money ever more than it was before. Mm -hmm. And that's not going away anytime soon. I predict as a result of COVID-19, we're gonna have deflationary pressure in the short term that's gonna push down rents. A lot of businesses are gonna be impacted, but new startups are gonna come up. New industries spawning from digital first enterprises. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be all about growing wealth. If we don't have wealth, if money is not part of the conversation, as in the whole world is UBI based, making $2,000 to $4,000 a month, then it'll be a creative economy. Um, But I'm not sure I see that even in my lifetime. Mm. Wow. So, David, that's a good way to end it off, I think. Um, uh, We're sitting at an hour and four. Uh, You did great, man. I guess to close it off, we'll just do a real, you know, quick fun question. are we in the simulation? <laughs> I have enjoyed during COVID-19 watching Upload, Westworld, and Devs. <laughs> um, for those in the audience, if you've not watched the new seasons yet, please check them out. Um, Devs especially is all about simulation. Again, no mm-hmm. spoiler, but it's in general, we know from episode one of Devs, are we in a simulation? Westworld, all three seasons, are we oh, in a yeah. simulation? Mm upload you even question that as well um even altered carbon one of the netflix series that got really big in the last couple years i think where we are in this existence of reality is a world and i'm science driven there is nothing yet that we know of that's not classified that tells me we are in a simulation or there is a multiverse Mm -hmm. when evidence shows it i'm all for it Count me in. But until then, this is our world, and this is the world we got to keep building and having humans work together with machines. Excellent. Excellent. A very scientific answer from David. Yes. So with that, guys, we'll be ending the episode here. Thank you, David, for coming out. And once yeah. again, guys. David, just... did you want to plug anything before we go? Yes. Any future projects, interviews, uh, anything you'd like the audience to check out? Yeah, if you're interested in AI, data science, future of work, and developer education, be sure to check out the Humane Podcast. You can check it out on humanepodcast.com. That's H-U-M-A-I-N podcast.com. Uh, a lot of great leaders in the industry coming on every single week uh, and always looking forward to bring on anyone who you might enjoy listening to as well. Excellent, excellent. So yeah, guys, make sure you go ahead and check out David's podcast. And then, of course, guys, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share our podcast as well, The Eigen Bros. And go to eigenbros.com for this uh, for the rest of the episodes. And uh, I guess that's it. David, thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thanks, Terrence. Thanks, Juan. Be safe. Stay healthy. Cool. All right. See you later. <laughs>